Daniel Suarez, Chase Elliott, and Michael McDowell battle 1v1v1 with a ticket to the NASCAR Cup Series playoffs on the line. How's it going, y'all? My name is Eric. Welcome to Out of the Groove Post Indianapolis Road Course Edition. What may be the final NASCAR Cup Series race on the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Road Course for quite some time. There's been a lot of chatter that the Oval may make its triumphant return next year, the Brickyard 400, and what would be the 30th anniversary of the first year of the Brickyard 400 when Jeff Gordon won back in 1994. But that's all hypothetical talking about the near future. We're here to talk about the here and now. A lot of stories coming into this race. First and foremost, there's the playoff bubble. Coming into today, only three races left in the regular season. Ty Gibbs holding a slim lead over Michael McDowell, Daniel Suarez, AJ Allmendinger, Chase Elliott a little further back in points, but both great road course racers had to have circled this race as potentially a golden opportunity to win their way in. But beyond the playoffs, there was a lot of focus put on the international stars in the field. Shane Van Gisbergen returning to NASCAR just weeks after his triumphant victory at Chicago. Brody Kostecki, fellow supercars racer, joining him driving for RCR this week. Kamui Kobayashi driving for 2311. Mike Rockenfeller filling in in the 42. Jensen Button, former F1 champion, driving the 15. Seven different countries were represented in today's NASCAR Cup Series field, which is cool for NASCAR that there are so many world-class drivers interested in participating. And it also helps bring, I'm sure, plenty of international attention to NASCAR. I don't remember who tweeted it today, but I think someone said that in Japan, they rarely get any NASCAR Cup Series races on TV, but today they made an exception. I'm sure there were a good handful of TVs in Japan tuned in to Indianapolis to watch Kamui Kobayashi. So that's really cool. But those were the two major storylines coming into today. We will break down both in great detail in just a few moments, but let's begin with the battle for the win. Early on, this race established three main characters, coincidentally, all on the NASCAR playoff bubble. Daniel Suarez started this race on pole, but lost the lead to Michael McDowell. Michael McDowell went on to win stage one. Daniel Suarez finished a solid second. And Chase Elliott, who had a strong qualifying effort, finished third. With no more stage cautions uh, on road courses this season, the race stayed green, the pit cycle played out, those three were able to really take control of this race. Side note, there was only one caution today. No cautions for stages. The only caution was, I think, when Logano door slammed Justin Haley through the kink on the back straightaway, sent him in the tire barriers. That was the only caution today. That has to be maybe like a modern record, you know, at least in the stage racing era, because with stages there's always at least two cautions per race, usually. Someone will have to look that up for me. Uh, but yeah, there was only one caution today, which means this race ended with like a nearly 80 lap long green flag run. So uh, strategy played out naturally. The race played out naturally. But because there were so few cautions, no chances to reset, to re-rack them and stack them, drivers up front had to execute perfectly. The race teams had to execute perfectly. This is where Daniel Suarez, one of our three main characters, fell out of contention. In stage three, uh, during a green flag pit stop, the front tire changer's hose got caught underneath Suarez's left front tire. The jackman had to run all the way back around the car, rejack up the left side so they could dislodge it. Lost probably five, six seconds to McDowell and Chase Elliott. And again, with no cautions, there was no chance for Suarez to make up six seconds on track over the course of less than one fuel run. That left Chase Elliott and Michael McDowell to settle it amongst themselves. Michael McDowell ran a near perfect race. He was fastest in practice yesterday, Saturday, qualified inside the top five, was able to take the lead from Daniel Suarez cleanly early on, won the first stage. Then in stage two, because Denny Hamlin and Brad Keselowski employed a different pitch strategy, McDowell couldn't get the stage win, but on the last lap, he was able to get two for one, getting by Keselowski and Daniel Suarez in one corner. Michael McDowell earned 19 stage points. Once Hamlin and Keselowski cycled out, McDowell once again was the race leader, and while Daniel Suarez and team made a mistake on pit road, McDowell's team executed flawlessly. And then in the closing stretch, Michael McDowell had to hold off Chase Elliott 
arguably the best road course racer in the business. He had to hold off a Hendrick Motorsports Chevy, beat a Hendrick Motorsports pit crew. Michael McDowell, Front Row Motorsports, they rose to the occasion. Michael McDowell wins his first race of the season. It's his second career win. It's his first non-super speedway win. Welcome to the playoffs, Michael McDowell. This is a cool story because to me, you can really see the improvement out of not only Front Row Motorsports, but Michael McDowell specifically the past three years or so. Like the results are tangible. You go back a couple of years, go back to 2021, the Daytona 500, fiery last lap crash, Michael McDowell emerges victorious. And soon after that, I remember there were reports that Love's Travel Stop signed a major sponsor deal with the team. I'm not sure how much that helped, but in 2021, McDowell set a career best average finish at the time of 20.5, a solid foundation, a step in the right direction. In 2022, the first year of the next gen car, Michael McDowell set a new career high with 12 top 10s and set a new career best average finish of 16.7. So clearly from year one to year two, the 34 team, Michael McDowell, they became more competitive. But then, oh, suddenly Hendrick Motorsports catches wind of the 34 success and poaches their crew chief, steals Blake Harris. He joins Alex Bowman. I fully expected the 34 team to take a big step backwards this year. They have done anything but. Sure, they're lagging behind last year in terms of top 10s, a slightly worse average finish, but they've been in playoff contention on points in recent weeks. And today, with new crew chief Travis Peterson, I just mentioned it, Michael McDowell wins his first non-super speedway race, runs a near flawless event. Michael McDowell deserves a ton of credit. Bob Jenkins, everyone at Front Row Motorsports deserves a bunch of credit. And this comes just a few days after Front Row Motorsports made headlines by exercising their option on McDowell and Todd Gilliland. In my video earlier this week, I debated whether Todd Gilliland was the right choice or not, but there was no debate regarding Michael McDowell in my eyes. He's only 38 years old. He's still in the prime of his career. Look at what he's done the past three seasons. McDowell was a lock. Front row had had to extend or exercise their option. I've not had any concerns with Michael McDowell. Today, he gets that team into the playoffs. Really cool moment. Really happy for Michael McDowell and Front Row Motorsports. A great story this season. Let's talk about second place finisher Chase Elliott because he needs to win. After that crash last weekend at Michigan, for sure, Chase Elliott has to win. And he had a golden opportunity about eight car lengths in front of him on the last lap of today's race. It stings to come up short after being oh so close, but I am still very confident in Chase Elliott. I've been saying this for a few weeks now, even after last week's crash at Michigan. I'm still more confident in Chase Elliott's ability to make the playoffs than miss them because Watkins Glen is on deck. After today, I'm even more confident in Chase Elliott's abilities. He will be the favorite going into next weekend's race. I'm picking him to win. I know being in a must-win situation is tough. It's one race. Anything can happen. As we saw today, there are other great road course racers and teams in the field, but Chase Elliott was top five in qualifying, top five in both the stages, second place in the race and was charging hard. If they had two or three more laps, I think he may have beat Michael McDowell. I am even more confident now that Chase Elliott will win Watkins Glen and make his way into the playoffs. He is the clear favorite next weekend in my eyes. I want to pull up the top finishers real quick, uh, point out a few other key finishers. Tyler Reddick, last year's Indy Road Course winner, finishes a very strong fourth. Uh, Alex Bowman, Similar to his teammate Chase Elliott in must-win territory when it comes to making the playoffs, he gets a solid top five. Chase Briscoe, always good on the Indy road course, gets a solid sixth place finish. Then you got Truex, you got Larson, you got Christopher Bell. Larson fresh off another Knoxville Nationals win last night. Pretty crazy. Then you have Shane Van Gisbergen. Backs up his Chicago street race win with a solid top 10 finish. I guess we can transition now to talking a little more about the international driver battle. What Shane Van Gisbergen did at Chicago was incredible. One of the most impressive feats I've witnessed in my years of being a NASCAR fan. But at the same time, we have to admit that Chicago was a completely unique beast. A track, a layout that no one in the Cup Series field had ever seen. Wet weather conditions, changing conditions throughout the race. That was a very special event. That's not to take anything away from Shane Van Gisbergen, but I think we all knew. Going to the Indy Road Course, a track that everyone in the Cup Series field has seen a couple of times, everyone expected SVG to come down to earth a little bit. I think we all thought he'd be fast. I predicted I think he'd finish 8th. He ended up 10th. I was close. I figured he'd be good, but I didn't think he was going to be a real threat to win the race today. And he wasn't. 
that's not to take anything away from SVG. His first two cup races are a first and a 10th. Like <laughs> that's still insane. I think he learned a lot out there tonight. And I think now, you know, we've got the news this week that he's signing a, a wide ranging development deal with Trackhouse. So he more than likely won't be in cup full time next year. Maybe that is the smart path forward. Personally, I'm kind of a fan of the trial by fire method. Just throw him out there next year, get him all the practice, all the seat time he can in a next gen car. But if he ends up doing part-time cup, a bunch of trucks and maybe some Xfinity starts, I get that as well. He learned today that, hey, there are a lot of very good road racers in the NASCAR Cup Series. Maybe not quite as good as him, but still very good. And if they hit on the setup or go to a track that they're more familiar with, then they can be tough to beat. That's what Shane Van Gisbergen learned today. He still won the battle of you know, the international drivers, or I guess, I guess technically Daniel Suarez from Mexico finished inside the top five. But as far as, you know, part-time, you know, international stars racing in NASCAR, I think next best finisher was Brody Kostecki in 22nd. Rockenfeller was 24th, Jensen Button 28th, and Kamui Kobayashi, I mean, I felt bad for him. He just got KO'd by Ricky Stenhouse there towards the end. Uh, He ends up finishing 33rd. A couple other drivers I want to mention here real quick. I think Chris Buescher had like an eight or nine race top 10 streak at road courses coming into today. He missed out by one position finishing 11th. So that kind of stinks. Uh, Ty Gibbs. I think Ty Gibbs had a top five car today, but he never got a chance to truly show it because early on in this race, Joey Logano missed turn one, slid into the back of his teammate, Ryan Blaney, caused a bunch of bumper cars there on the inside lane. And SVG got into Gibbs, then kind of finished him off. But Gibbs got spun out early on. And again, with no other cautions all day, there was no way to make up all that lost time on on track or through strategy even. There was really nothing Ty Gibbs could do. Uh, he drove his way back to 12th. He won the Xfinity race yesterday, so I think it's safe to say he knows how to get around Indianapolis. It's a shame he got spun because that's another bubble driver that I think may have had something. I don't know if he had everything, but he had something for Suarez maybe McDowell, maybe Chase Elliott. We didn't get to see that today, which was kind of a bummer. Also shout out William Byron. He had to come from the back. Uh, He failed inspection multiple times yesterday, had to do a pass through at the beginning, got kind of bailed out by that early caution. uh, But even then drove up to 14th. So not bad. Only other finisher I want to mention is AJ Allmendinger. He finished 26. Now he didn't have a 26 place car, but it's safe to say he didn't have a winning car either. And this is something I predicted Wednesday night on our live stream we did on the channel if you missed it. AJ Allmendinger was a popular pick for this race. I'm sure he was a very uh, popular dark horse bet as well. But, you know, I talked to him at Michigan last week and he did not sound super confident in his team's road course setup or performance. And so I was kind of off the AJ Allmendinger bandwagon. I figured he'd run 10th to 15th. And I think that's the highest in the leaderboard I ever saw him. But I didn't think he would show winning speed at any point in today's race. And he never did. And unfortunately, got kind of cleaned out by Ryan Blaney, it looked like. And then later on, I think missed the corner, got spun out. Something else happened. Ends up 26th. But even going into Watkins Glen next week, I'm sure a lot of folks will circle AJ Allmendinger's name. I don't know. I'm still off the bandwagon for the time being. AJ Allmendinger at one point and maybe even still, was widely considered to be the best road racer in the NASCAR Cup Series. That may very well be the case still, but I'm not sold on that whole team. I'm not sold on the complete package right now. So I'm I'm sort of off the Allmendinger hype train for the time being. Let's flip this around and take a look at how the playoff bubble has changed because Michael McDowell entered today 17th. He was outside looking in. Now he's not even pictured because he's safely locked up there with a victory. Now it's Bubba Wallace, who, who has to be relieved that he scored so many points in recent weeks, especially last week at Michigan in the stages. He no longer has the cushion he once had. He used to be two spots out of the cut line, plus like 58 points. Now he's on the cut line. The last guy in, plus 28. I'll make this quick. Ty Gibbs on down. They have to win one of these next two races. Fortunately for Ty Gibbs, Chase Elliott, even Alex Bowman, they're all pretty good road racers and Watkins Glen is next week. Daniel Suarez, Plus 28 is the only driver here outside looking in that I think has a chance to point his way in. And that's because if you look at today in the stages, Suarez earned 17 stage points. Let's say next week he earns, you know, 13, 14, boom. All of a sudden he's cut that deficit in half because I don't think Bubba Wallace, not a great road racer, scores any stage points. If he's cut that deficit in half and then say finishes in the top 10 and Bubba finishes like 15th, that's probably another 10 points. All of a sudden, that deficit is down to like low single digits with 
Daytona looming, and anything can happen at Daytona. Sure, you know Daniel Suarez, Bubba may not be in full control of their own destiny, but I feel a lot better about a single digit deficit than I do 28 points. I think Suarez can make that up next weekend at Watkins Glen. So I don't think he's in must win territory. They just can't make mistakes on pit road. Please. I've been begging for consistency from Daniel Suarez and the 99 team. And oh, it's just been up and down, up and down, but they've been fast lately. They've had speed. That's most important. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens next weekend at Watkins Glen. That's going to paint a very clear picture for Daytona the week after. But that's a look at your playoff bubble. Uh, Let's put this race on the groovy gauge and get out of here. I think Jeff Gluck said it best on Twitter or X. He he X'd something along the lines of, you know, for a race that only had one caution, this has been pretty tense. And I agree. Although I'll admit what I think made this race most intriguing were those specific main characters. If instead of McDowell, Suarez, and Elliott, we're talking about, you know, Byron, Truex and Hamlin, you know, a bunch of guys who've already won this year. I'm not sure this race is quite as intense, but because he had three drivers all looking for their first win of the season, all on the playoff bubble in prime position to potentially lock themselves in, that ratcheted the drama up significantly. So I'm going to go 75% for this race, even if it was the Truex, Byron, Hamlin, you know, more established guys racing for the win. We still had some exciting racing at the end of stage two. That was dramatic. We had some spins and some crashes early on. And at the very end, second place was charging hard, was eating into first place leads significantly. Still wasn't a bad race in my opinion, but considering the characters involved, I'm going 75%. Let me know down in the comment section below if you agree or disagree with my score. But I think that's going to do it. I think I've covered uh, all the ground I was hoping to. Thanks for watching, y'all. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like. It helps me out a ton. If you're new to the channel and you love all things NASCAR, you're in the right place. Hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any future episodes. And a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters for your extremely generous support. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend, folks. I will see you again really, really soon. Take care, y'all.